Hello, Hello. Assalamualaikum and a very good morning to all. Uh, welcome to today's Mind the Gap series webinar organized by National Coaching Academy of National Sports Institute of Malaysia. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome everyone, state and national coaches, uh, Majlis Ukan Negeri, uh, fellow colleagues and friends. Uh, my name is uh, Zarif Ismail and I work as a sports physiotherapist under the Sports Medicine Division at Institute Sukan Negara. Uh, today's topic, we are going to cover strategies to lower risk of injury upon resumption of training post-MCO in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, do note, I will be conducting the entire webinar in English um, because we have some international audience, especially from International Council of Coaching Excellence, uh, ICCE. So I would like to welcome them as well. Um, uh, this uh, webinar will be uh, is aimed for primarily for the coaches so we will be keeping it simple and uh, we'll have less kind of um, scientific terms and for easy to understand um, if you do have any questions uh, please do so um, ask them in the comment section and we will uh, I will try and answer them as best as possible in the Q&A session uh, at the end of the webinar okay so without further ado we will start um, with explaining what MCO is. Okay, so MCO is short for movement control order. Um, in Europe, uh, they have what's it called a lockdown. So, of course, if you've not been living under a rock in Malaysia, you know what MCO is. So basically, just to recap, so it started on the started on 18th of March after a spike in uh, COVID-19 cases. Uh, this halted all non-essential business operation, including sports events and participation. Um, it impacted all tournaments, both nationally and internationally. Uh, of course, this came at a, bit, uh, at a bit, uh, busy period, especially for Olympic uh, qualification tournament. Um, myself, I just uh, came back from an all-England badminton tournament um, uh, on the 16th of March, uh, just before the lockdown. Um, that was an Olympic qualification tournament as well um, so following that tournament um, mostly uh, tournaments in the in the global stage uh, is halted okay this meant that training would also be stopped um, athletes needed uh, to train at home um, when they are training at home it was hard for them to replicate a normal training routine as uh, resources are limited um, in the end, uh, non-contact sport um, was allowed again to be resumed from the government of Malaysia um, on the 15th of June. And we will be looking at uh, how the impact of MCO on the athletes and how we will have a strategy to, um, to eradicate or let's say reduce the number of uh, injuries that is bound to happen uh, at this stage. Okay, so the content of this webinar will be number one, uh, we'll be looking at the brief overview of impact of MCO on athletes. Number two, uh, how MCO affect athletes mindset when resuming training. And then we'll be looking at identifying different contributing factors to injuries. We're we'll looking at um, and the main bulk of the webinar will be to recognize the strategies to reduce the risk of injury and how coaches can implement these strategies to aid athletes' performance. Okay, so we will be going to looking at the federal SOP. Uh, I picked up only a few important ones, uh, such as uh, social distancing, unnecessary interaction, uh, contact tracing through MySojakra app, uh, sanitize sports equipment um, after each use, uh, frequent use of hand sanitizers, uh, no training in large groups, non-contract training, obviously, and also importantly, uh, temperature checks. Um, this is all extracted from the National uh, Security Council um, on the 10th of June. So why federal uh, SOP is important? Well, because health and safety should be the utmost priority. We are, remember, we are still in a pandemic, so strict rules in place must be followed. Uh, secondly, failing to adhere will result in uh, jeopardizing any lapsed efforts in restarting training. So if um, 
for instance, if an athlete uh, do contract or test positive for COVID-19, that will uh, put a halt to any kind of uh, further advancements in, in, in trying to um, restart uh, training and uh, competitions again. Okay. Next, we are going to be looking at uh, impact of MCO on athletes. I've broken it down into three uh, elements, prolonged quarantine and its effects on physical shape and also psychological impacts on forms and results. Okay, a study in Canada during the SARS outbreak in 2003 found quarantine resulted in high prevalence of psychological distress. Um, especially athletes, um, especially it affects athletes that has uh, a previous uh, history of depression. Um, athletes may suffer from situational depression because exercise normally helps to bolster their psychological health. So a lack of social interactions, uh, not being able to go out and having physical contact with loved, loved ones, that's going to have a detrimental effect on their mental well-being. Okay, and physical shape, of course, is going to affect them in a physical way as well. So staying in shape is tough, especially when training resources are limited. Um, so this is an unprecedented way of training uh, for many of the athletes around the world. So adaptations would need to take place. Uh, for instance, um, having a kind of a, a strength session or yoga session, um, through a kind of group or conference call. So that's kind of a, a new way of, of trying to adapt to, to this um, kind of uh, this uh, pandemic that we are at. Okay. And of course, next one is also disturb uh, sleeping habits. Um, so when you're not in a normal training routine, uh, maybe the body find it hard to kind of switch off at night. Some athletes uh, will kind of pass the time playing games or binge watching movies until late night. So that's going to have an effect on the sleeping habits. And also a possible increase in percentage of body fat uh, or body weight. Uh, this is because the, it's easy to uh, kind of consume or overeat um, at this time. And you are not uh, having uh, uh, an output or burning off of that calorie. Um, so when you have an imbalance, so that's when you can increase the percentage of body fat, body weight. Okay, the next one is a massive uh, disruption to form, um, causing uh, emotional distress. I would like to share you one example. Um, when I was working in the All England, um, our uh, men's single, number one men's single badminton player, um, many of you may know, um, he broke into the top 10 for the first time. So he was in the form of his life. Um, however, after the All England finish on the 6th of March, um, lockdown happened. So, it, although the, the, the ranking points are going to be staying the same, however, the form uh, is going to be causing kind of a, an, an emotional distress, not being able to, uh, you know, um, possibly being able to go back to that form um, post MCO. Okay. I'm going to share you, um, uh, well, this, this, this table is taken from an ASPETA guideline, um, how it affects the physical elements uh, in, in kind of more specific, okay? So it's broken down to three uh, main components, so neuromuscular, cardiorespiratory, uh, musculoskeletal. As you can see from the uh, neuromuscular, I'll just pick out a few, there's um, reduced inflexibility, reduced in muscle strength. Um, in the cardiorespiratory, there's a reduced in maximum cardiac output, reduced lactic threshold, reduced endurance performance. Um, in the musculoskeletal uh, component, uh, you get a reduction in glycogen synthase activity, a reduction in mitochondrial ATP production. This is very important for uh, the process of uh, uh, in energy uh, production. So all this is gathered from uh, various different studies. Uh, they all converge into one table for to make it for us to easily understand kind of the results of each uh, effect. Huh? Okay. So we're going to go into uh, detraining and retraining. Uh, by term, detraining 
means a period of time where an absence in normal training routine occurs. So the amount of time that the normal training uh, absent in normal training occur. And retaining is a time required to regain back the physiological and psychological losses during uh, the detraining period. Okay, so hopefully that's uh, quite easy to understand. Okay, so a study by Hua Zhou, 2018, so recent work in semi-professional soccer players has shown a remarkable reduction in endurance capacity and repeated sprint ability after just two weeks. So two weeks, remarkable reduction in endurance capacity and repeated sprint ability. However, two weeks of retraining might bring back, uh, might bring these back to the previous level. So more or less one-to-one. -one. So two weeks of detraining, two weeks of retraining. Okay, and the next study from Prudam et al, 2015, so quite recent, assuming, uh, sorry, so assuming that players stayed without football specific training for roughly four weeks and that their workload during that period was about 20 to 40 percent of that normal uh, competitive period the recommended time for returning to full training without a high risk of injury is estimated to be three to five weeks so even with 20 to 40 percent of workload uh, against the normal kind of competitive uh, workload. Um, so roughly, if you have been doing a detraining for about four weeks, you will require about three to five weeks to retrain again. Okay, so you understand the importance of time frame, how we need to kind of gradually build up um, and the amount of time needed for us to get back, uh, get back that it to a uh, pre-MCO uh, level, okay? So remember MCO is about three months. So it's going to take quite a while, even if, especially when you are at least that has a kind of a low workload um, during that time. Uh, most, I think most coaches uh, during that time may have a kind of a program uh, for the athletes to do. Um, but this comes back to kind of with, um, how the athletes uh, react to it and how they comply with the program that is given to them. Um, that is hard to measure as well. Um, if, for instance, if you have a data on that, then that will be uh, uh, kind of a better uh, study. Okay. Okay, we are going to move into um, incorrect approaches uh, to resuming training. So, again, uh, three components or three elements. Um, so, the first one is over eagerness. Um, reaching previous best as soon as possible and being too critical on self. This is all has to do with uh, how an athlete um, react to, uh, you know, possible um, you know, uh, resuming training. So this is a possible uh, effect when they are, you know, starting uh, training again. Okay, so over eagerness. Naturally, athletes will be eager to return because, you know, they are athletes, so they want to get back to what they are doing best. Okay, there will be lamenting um, their losses during MCO, especially on strength and aerobic capacity. Um, for instance, for athletes that have uh, limited resources, uh, they're kind of doing more body work. Um, so they're not kind of reaching to the capacity that they are doing pre-MCO. Okay. Um, so this is all have more to do with how the athletes uh, approach uh, retraining. Okay, so it can also lead to over asserting. Uh, in a short period of time, um, there would mostly be a brief loss of agility, proprioceptive, and neuromuscular control as well. Um, so that can lead to uh, injuries if uh, not careful at the early stage. Um, reaching previous best as soon as possible. Um, that they will be mentally anxious to reach uh, best capacity. They were pushing themselves too hard for fearing of inadequacy. Um, and then there will be lack of planning on structured and gradual return to train strategies and also not making use of sports science support in the initial phase. So the, 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 the final two, uh, the lack planning and not making use of sports science, that has to do with kind of um, how the coach uh, impact and how the coach uh, approach uh, the training session. So that has to do more kind of with the coach's role. 
The last one is uh, being too critical on self. Only normal to feel frustrated and disappointed for not fulfilling pre MCO physical shape. Coaches here uh, again play a huge role to reassure that they will get back to their uh, initial state, uh, initial phase, um, but uh, it will take a bit of time. They have to work gradually towards it. Okay. Um, so, next one I was going to share with you is factors, contributing factors to injury. Uh, four main components. The first one is intrinsic factors. So intrinsic factor relates to kind of the anatomical and pathological makeup. So what's within from the athlete itself. First one, physical factors. So whether the athlete um, already lack in fitness or have an early onset of fatigue. Um, and then there's individual difference factors, whether the athlete is already injury pro. Um, whether they already have a recurrent injury problem or chronic uh, kind of ankle uh, injury and so on. Um, last one is age factor as well, so slower rate of uh, recovery. Okay, next one is uh, extrinsic factor. So extrinsic factor relates to environmental factor relating to training or competition. So this is uh, kind of where the coach can play a role. So training related factors uh, due to overloading from uh, a poor training design, um, equipment related factors, um, environmental factors such as the wet surfaces. Uh, next one is psychological factors. So psychological factors, um, being in a state of over or under arouse can lead to injury. So there needs to be a fine line, the right motivation and the right amount of uh, mental uh, input um, uh, approaching to training. Um, that needs to be in place. Huh? Okay, next one is nutritional factors. I hope you can read it. It's on the side there. Um, these factors really encompass ensuring athletes has adequate glycogen stores, hydration, and protein intake. Uh, so without correct protein intake, an individual soft tissue may not recover or adapt properly. So as you can see, there's four contributing kind of umbrella term uh, factors to injury. So Injuries is not an isolated uh, event. It's complex and intricate. It can be a combination of different factors as well. So we have to pinpoint um, kind of the etiology and the causes of the injury from um, where it falls under the contribu contributing factors of injury. Okay. So next one, we're going to go on to um, what the stats say. Okay. So this first uh, image. Uh, I got from um, Physio Room. They are responsible for gathering uh, injury data in uh, Premier League football. Um, so since the restart, um, first 12 games, um, there have been seven um, in-play injuries since the restart. So the 12 games, seven uh, injuries. So that gives um, the rate of 0 0.58 uh, injuries per game. Okay. And the next one is Germany's uh, Bundesliga. So the headline there, Germany injury rate tripled after the restart. Dr. Joel Mason, a sports scientist based in Berlin, has been tracking the Bundesliga injury list. According to Dr. Mason, Bundesliga injury went from a pre-lockdown average of 0 0.2 seven per game to 0 0.88 in the first round of competition resume. So 0 0.27 to 0 0.88. So that's quite a, a big jump in injury. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Germany's Bundesliga had about three weeks of uh, training, three weeks before the competition starts. So from the government uh, guideline that they're able to train again uh, to come to first uh, match in about three weeks. Okay. Another um, diagram that I want to show you is a very interesting study, quite uh, kind of one of the most current research that we have from Stokes et al. Okay, if you can see the vertical uh, axis there uh, on table A, uh, injury incidents uh, per 1,000 hours. And then on the horizontal axis, uh, it's weeks since the start of pre-season. So I've put an arrow on about week six. As you can see, um, the dip in the number of injuries um, after that five, six weeks 
um, is quite uh, remarkable and because after that it kind of plateaus out until about 15 or 16. As you can see, going back to week one and week two, when they have a low um, low uh, intensity of training, the number of injuries is obviously less. And as soon as you go to about week two, three, and four, that's when it starts to build up again because of the increasing uh, intensity in training. And about week five, when the body is um, already kind of adapted to the amount of demand that is placed on it, the body has become stronger physically and mentally, of course, and you get a reduction in uh, number of injuries. It only just starts to pick up again at around week 16, 17. That's obviously because um, it's from week 6 to week 16 is about 10 weeks. So you say about two and a half months of non-stop football. So that's kind of uh, a normal injury uh, occurrence. So this is a very, very interesting uh, study. Yeah? So we can see that the effects of uh, having a gradual buildup of training intensity um, helps um, and, and, and also injury prevention helps to uh, reduce the number of uh, injuries, especially at the inner stage um, during uh, competition period um, and pre-season as well. So this study is from 2014-15 season to 2018-2019 and 2019 season. Okay. Okay, so we're going to go on to the kind of the main bulk of the webinar itself now. So this is the strategies to reducing the rate of injury. So this is kind of uh, what the coaches can take on board and the athletes also can take on board. I'll explain later why it's not just coaches, it's the athletes themselves as well. Okay, so we're going to go on to this 11, uh, broken down to different, uh, 11 different elements rather. So the first one is mental preparation. Next one is injury status, proper warm up, uh, gradual loading of intensity, uh, flexibility and mobility program, uh, incorporating injury prevention program, um, when best to do physiological testing, um, training frequency, hydration breaks, uh, listening to an athlete's body, and also engaging uh, sport science. Okay. So the first one is mental preparation. So what I will do is with the flow of this uh, slides, it will be one, what the coaches can do or the coaches response. Another one is athletes response as well. So the reason I do this is because it's not just an isolation of the coaches work and athletes work. It has to be a collective effort um, to reach the common goal, eh, which is trying to, you know, um, increase the performance level of the athletes. So both need to have uh, a role to play. Eh? So in the coaches' response, coaches need to know that not all athletes will have a positive mindset coming out of a prolonged period of quarantine. The reason I say this is because um, some athletes may um, have a kind of a more negative effect maybe not uh, kind of the main uh, kind of the majority number of athletes but there will be a few that kind of affect kind of more financially or um, you know there's psychological stresses they could have uh, kind of um, directly involved directly affected um, from COVID-19 whether you know, family members are contracted with like, positive for it and stuff like that as well so you need to make sure that um, it's not all level playing field. You have to have a special kind of um, special care with uh, some of these athletes. Huh? So establishing the right amount of motivation uh, is key. Okay, so you can over arouse and you're going to be under arouse as well. So the coach needs to play a role, especially with um, these type of uh, athletes. Huh? So like I said, so psychosocial well-being is key determinant to concentrate only for the reason uh, brain controls the body. So that's why I put this in the first stage. So mental, uh, psychological uh, well-being is, uh, is, is, is very important. So if the brain is not um, responding uh, or, 
or working properly, the body is not gonna not gonna follow suit. So we have to make sure that we address the, the problem of mental well-being first, first and foremost. Okay. The next one is uh, athletes' response. Okay. So I think need to also recognize that uh, sports are not 100%. Uh, sorry, sports are not 100% uh, physical or 90% physical and 10% mental, like it used to be before. At, um, sports is 100% mental and 100% physical. They are both equally necessary for success. They both complement each other and both needs to be um, taken care of uh, properly. Yeah? Um, next one is mental skill training um, and practice uh, could reduce uh, injury rate by reducing anxiety and allowing an athlete to achieve uh, optimum uh, arousal um, for their sport. Um, so again, um, there's there's a lot of uh, kind of mental skill training that are available uh, even online. Or you can even speak to, we have many kind of uh, sports uh, psychologists here that can provide you some kind of a mental game um, or kind of more individualized training for whatever uh, problems that you may have uh, mentally. Yeah? Okay. And you also need to know increasing kind of the mental flexibility, mental responsiveness, mental strength, and also mental resilience. What mental flexibility is uh, ability to stay calm in the face of adversities. Um, responsiveness um, is the ability to respond in a healthy way to a situation as they arise. Uh, mental strength, we hear mental strength a lot. So the ability to withstand uh, pressure and uh, being in a state of emotionally balanced. And resilience, uh, ability to quickly and bounce back. So a lot of uh, when you see sports that have a, a comeback from an athlete that's that this is where all this comes into play yeah? so of course uh when when you have all this it also helps in reduction of injury and help the athlete to perform in a better state okay so what i will do is also um, after each uh, strategy i will insert a quote so it make it easier to um for us to understand yeah? okay so sports injury is more than the result of an isolated physical event. The causes of sports injuries are complex, meaning the response to prevention and rehabilitation must be as intricate. Therefore, sports professionals must take a biopsychosocial approach to the avoidance and management of sports injury. So as you can see there, sports professionals, so this uh, not only coaches, coach, athletes, uh, sports scientists as well, working with the team, and basically everyone that is uh, involved with uh, the athlete has to take a biopsychosocial approach. So biopsychosocial approach is not just um, kind of uh, uh, physical uh, effects, but also the mental effects and everything has to be um, um, intricate huh? for the management of uh, injury. Okay, so next one, we're gonna go into uh, injury status. So again, the coach's response and that response we're going to the coach's response. Uh, important to establish up-to-date injury status as some athletes may have developed um, injuries during MCO or probably they have not fully recovered from a long-term injury uh, pre-MCO. So need to establish up-to-date injury status. Okay. Uh, do note that some athletes will hide injuries to rush inclusion into team training, especially when you have been out for so long. Um, those niggling injuries that especially when they had it since the early stages of MCO, but it has not gone away and the athlete knows, but they will try to hide just to rush inclusion. Um, it's, not, it's, not very, it's not very good and the coach needs to pick up on that also. Um, of course, if there, are, if there is uh, injuries, uh, immediate referral onto sports medical team for exact diagnosis and prognosis is vital, okay? As an athlete, honest and transparent feedback from athlete is required. Um, if injured, use the appropriate channel and engage with rehabilitation program to make a full recovery. 
and also to regain confidence to return to training. Um, as a physio myself, um, I do get a lot that athletes don't tell coaches because they are kind of fear of uh, being excluded and missing out on competitions and so on. Um, as a physio, um, during rehab, we actually we don't let you just rest if you have injuries. We do alternative programs to meet uh, training load requirements. So don't be afraid of missing out at this stage. And it's better to tell because you are going to have a better recovery uh, moving forward. Huh? So in the quotes, over the years, the number of athletes not reporting injuries has increased tremendously. Studies that have been conducted as recently as 2015 on athletes have shown that nearly 40% of high school athletes and about 45 to 50% uh, of college athletes are not reporting injuries. So that's quite a high number. Huh? Many athletes are not reporting their injuries for because they fear the repercussion of sitting out uh, of practice or games. So like I said before, so not reporting injuries can have, I say like, um, like I said before, it can have a devastating effect kind of in the long term. Coaches also need to act uh, on this because I, uh, from my experience, I get that some athletes do report it to the coach. However, the coach has not act on that. They force the athlete to train. So that makes the athlete reluctant to report anything after that. So they don't have the trust after that that they are going to be taken care of if they do uh, report during this. So they kind of just um, um, brush it under the carpet and say, okay, this is a minor injury and just let the athlete train. And what happens then is the injury is going to develop and develop and develop, accumulate, and it's going to have a, uh, a bad outcome in the long term. Okay. So next one we're going to go into is a proper warm-up. So in the coach's uh, response, sorry, uh, proper warm-up program reduces the risk of developing injuries. Uh, we know that a lot of studies have been shown and that's why we do it in practice. Okay. Uh, of course, it's to increase the elasticity of muscle, uh, its temperature and smoothing of uh, muscular contraction. This is especially important post quarantine as the body needs to gradually ease into restarting training. Also aim to spend a sufficient amount of time including all four warm-up stages. So recommended time is around 20 minutes uh, before training session. So this includes ballistic and dynamic stretches, strength, plyometric and balance work, uh, running activities to increase the heart rate to roughly around 70% and also sport specific drills to increase the neuromuscular facilitations. Okay, so athlete response, what it's going to do is stick to routine that works best. This is especially important for individual sports. So when you work with a kind of a badminton, I work with a squash team before, they, they have an individual warm-up routine, not warm-up, but all the same. So this works best for them. They have haven't had uh, injuries or kind of major injuries um, when sticking to that routine. So just kind of stick to that so you know that that one works for you and your body. Uh, mood and preparedness can fluctuate with each session. So the athletes need to know that uh, and they will, they will know that they will not be up to uh, a training session. Um, so one session you will probably be, you know, 100% aesthetic. Another one you're not not being uh, so much. So make sure they are warm up uh, sufficiently until you feel ready and pumped to go um, and, and tackle the, the, the training session. Huh? Uh, I also would like to share, uh, there's a, uh, one footballer that I worked with uh, when I worked in a football team before. He broke a bone in his hand. Uh, this was a, in a morning session. Huh? We had a, a warm up. Um, however, I noticed this uh, particular athlete didn't kind of um, didn't kind of feel up to it, just from his body language and so on. Um, so he only just broke ten from shielding a, a ball from a teammate. So it wasn't like a 
big kind of uh, impact or trauma. It was very kind of tough, and we were very surprised then when we broke uh, his, um, his his bone in his hand. Um, so what I observed from that is because the warm up and the coaches also uh, kind of recognize this. Um, it's because the the warm up routine wasn't kind of uh, kind of fifty fifty. Um, very kind of complacent in his uh, approach. So that's why he got the injury. And I think also uh, need to kind of um, invest, use kind of a heart rate monitor, like a Fitbit. It's very easy to kind of monitor your heart rate. And um, it's a cheap option. And at least needs to invest on that as well. OK, in the quotes, um, by carrying out functional activities such as sprinting or kicking the ball in the later stages of warm up, there will be an activation of neural pathways which speeds up reaction time during a match. In addition to the physiological effect, the warm up has the effect of preparing the player psychologically by encouraging them to focus on the physical activity to follow. So basically, when you react better, you can avoid injuries. Okay. The next one we're going to go into uh, gradual intensity loading or loading uh, gradual intensity loading. Okay, so coaches, especially at the start, must create a weekly realization plan. Okay, so um, coaches uh, probably most have been taught about the realization, uh, the three stages of realization, the mental cycle. Uh, micro cycle and macro cycle as well. So, when you create a uh, weekly presentation, it has to be a micro cycle. It's difficult to create a macro cycle, kind of a bigger picture, because we don't know uh, the time frame uh, when the competition is allowed to be uh, resumed again. So, for now, just create a micro cycle of weekly plan um, before um, commencing retraining. Okay, the recommended period uh, is a period of uh, low to moderate intensity for the initial two weeks. This is based, this is taken based on uh, ASPETA guideline. ASPETA is, uh, is one of the pioneers in sports medicine uh, uh, in the international stage. So very well respected uh, sports medicine, sports science uh, institute. Uh, higher priority should be placed on technical aspects with a uh, low impact drill. You should avoid strenuous physical loading at this stage. And also a gradual buildup of fitness and strength training intensity so that the body um, can slowly adapt to the increasing demand. So when we go back to the earlier table that I showed you, you see how the gradual buildup until the body can meet the demand. That's when the injury rate uh, reduces. Helps to reduce uh, delayed muscle soreness, DOMS. And at this stage, it's very crucial for the coaches to avoid that no pain and no gain approach. This will overexert the athlete to a point of breakdown. So make sure um, when, you, when, you, when you hurt there is pain, that's when you are pushing it too much. So make sure you are careful with the approach. Okay, as an athlete, uh, you need to provide uh, an honest uh, feedback to coaches about the intensity, especially in uh, individual sports. This creates uh, a, a balanced um, training load, uh, both that the athletes enjoy and the coaches are getting the amount of effort from the athletes that they, that they require. So open communication in this um, in this uh, aspect is very crucial. Um, always discuss on ways you can uh, further develop. Okay, in the quotes, be realistic about your training and not focus on what you used to do. So too much too soon can be the number one reason why injuries occur. Gradually increase your time and the intensity of your workouts to prevent those nagging injuries. Okay, so next one, next strategy is flexibility and mobility program. So as a coach, you should know that the more flexible 
athletes are, the less likely they are to get injured. So it is beneficial and highly recommended to be applied in a training design. Aim to have at least once a week uh, isolated session. Um, aim to do for about 30 minutes. Uh, you can do it in the middle of the week, let's say on a Wednesday, you know, isolate that session just purely for flexibility and mobility program. You can also um, incorporate this together with the warm up program to so increase the warm up time. So you'd have five, 10 minutes just to do kind of flexibility and mobility program before each training session. So, athletes, um, uh, this can be done during recovery or off day. Um, if uh, in the initial phase, when you are more kind of uh, at home or off field rather than on field, so this can be done. Uh, during that time, um, especially or like a group conference call, um, I know like a lot of football teams, uh, especially family football teams, doing MCO, they do their kind of yoga work, uh, Pilates work uh, in a group conference call. Uh, so, like I said, there are many uh, online resources uh, for you to follow. Uh, so, you need to make sh a habit of being flexible. Uh, also, they, they need to, you know, invest, like I said again, uh, foam rollers is very good uh, to work on the flexibility and mobility programs. This work on the myofascial release so the, the body don't feel as tight, the muscles are loosened and the joints are loose as well. Um, England rugby um, have incorporated this uh, strategy as a staple strategy in uh, injury prevention program. Uh, they have a markedly reduced number of injuries in the past uh, workout. So this is not just for you know gymnastics. This is for uh, rugby players and all the you know, strength-based kind of uh, power-based uh, sports as well. In the quotes, mobility designate exercise that will increase your range of motion and your stabilization uh, or control of the muscle that surround each joint. So inadequate. Mobility and stability lead to about 90% of the injuries that come into our physical uh, therapy practice. So this is based on subjective uh, observation uh, of why uh, people are getting injuries. So that's quite a high number uh, because of the lack of mobility and stability. Okay, next one, we are going uh, to move on to uh, injury uh, prevention program. Okay, as a coach, um, I'll just include some examples. There's the FIFA 11 Plus, uh, PEP program, uh, KIPP, uh, knee injury prevention program, and sports uh, metrics as well. So there's many others as well. Injury prevention program are designed to decrease acute and overuse injuries in athletes, uh, and it has been uh, proven uh, effective. There are, there are general and sports specific programs. Uh, however, most programs are a combination of the two, which has a better outcome. Uh, IPP should be applied throughout the year and emphasized on proper technique and not just the complexity of uh, the exercise. Um, you can also merge this uh, together with the warm up routine. Um, and also, at the end, you should that you, IPP can be designed by using a model by uh, Van Mukele, I think in 1995, it's quite a while ago. And um, if you have access to team therapists, uh, they should have input from team therapists. So this is, I share you just uh, kind of the uh, the graph from uh, Van Mukele. No? So there's four steps to it. No? So establish the extent of injury, and the next one is finding uh, the cause of the injury, step three, introduce the preventive measure, and then assess again. So one of the most research topics within the sports medical field is uh, injury prevention program. Many coach uh, have heard or know about injury prevention program and know that the studies there support um, injury prevention program to reduce the rate of injury, but how many actually do implement it? Okay, so that's the question you need to ask. Uh, injuries are not down to just your luck. 
So you need to um, approach, have a, a strategic approach, incorporate injury prevention program. You can reduce the number of injuries for your athletes. In the court, uh, athlete injury risk may remain high as they maximize their limit and accept risk as part of the sport. They may have low adherence to prevention program that take them away from skills development and mistake injuries for normal delayed onset muscle soreness. There are three ways to reduce injuries within sport. Construct a prioritization plan, prepare for injury prevention, analyze the load management, and implement specific strength training program. So the keyword here I would like to just go back to is lower adherence to prevention program. So here coaches have a role to play in getting athletes to adhere to this uh, injury prevention program. Um, the way to do this is have a consistency. Consistency is key. The coaches recognize this. They have to um, kind of uh, explain the importance and emphasize it so they have to do it uh, in, uh, in incorporated in the training session so the athletes uh, buy into that and they are more uh, kind of compliant to the to performing injury progression program. Huh? I will show you uh, two examples uh, people 11 class and also Osla, uh, sorry, uh, Oslo Sports uh, Trauma Research Center. So as you can see, they incorporate elements of aerobic and anaerobic exercises with inclusion for strength, biometric, and balance work. Uh, FIFA 11 Plus, especially this, has been developed specifically for football, um, uh, elite football, and even grassroots football can work. Um, so they have a high number of reduction of injuries, especially with um, ACL and chemistry injuries up to about 50%. So it's quite good um, uh, injury prevention program to use uh, during your uh, training. Okay. Next one we're gonna use, we're gonna we're gonna discuss is uh, the strategy uh, of uh, when to use physiological testing. So the baseline testing should only be considered at around three weeks uh, following restart. So maximal testing such as isokinetic strength tests and yo-yo intermittent tests require considerable amount of effort. So three weeks is sufficient amount of time uh, for the body to have adequate strength and endurance to undergo the maximal uh, testing. Huh? So risking injury when the body is not ready uh, to meet the demands, obviously uh, the test result will be much more reliable and accurate when the athletes are more primed. So if you do it around, if they come back and about two or three days after they come back and start doing it, you're not going to have an accurate result and you are risking injury, obviously. Um, the last one, the result should be close to pre-MCO level and if not, can be used as a marker for retesting for the next session. You have to make sure that this acts as a guide and not to penalize uh, the athlete. Okay. The quotes to reduce the risk of injury in the first phase of retraining, maximal testing activities should be avoided. Any physical assessment performed, if coaches decide to, are uh, using mostly submaximal efforts. So you can still do within that time, but it has to be submaximal effort. But however, um, nearly all testing are uh, testing to a kind of maximal effort. Uh, hence, it is better to complete the three week cycle to avoid the risk of exertional injuries. Next strategy we're going to move on to is training frequency. So the coach's action, training schedule should consider sufficient recovery days. So training frequency should have in mind the recovery days uh, as an important element to mitigate the in uh, injury risk. Uh, recommended time frame is no more than four days training in a week. So initial two week phase, uh, initial two week phase is one session per day, lasting uh, no more than sixty minutes each. So it's quite a low intensity. And then after two weeks, you can increase this further to two sessions per day 
Um, however, no more than 75 minutes each. So this is uh, taken again from uh, ASPETA uh, guideline. Um, at ISEN, we currently haven't created uh, uh, this um, kind of phase um, phase or graded return yet, but we will be hopefully we'll be working towards uh, creating one for uh, use or guidelines for our athletes. Um, use uh, athletes also uh, sorry coach can also use a RPE chart a rating of perceived exertion uh, as an important tool. Uh, this is the recommended guideline. However, athletes uh, whoever reporting like a uh, high score, especially in the first uh, you know first two weeks or three weeks, uh, if they're reporting uh, an eight and above in the first few training, coaches uh, may look to increase uh, recovery time or look again at the training load that they are doing. So RPE rating of perceived accession is a good tool to use. Uh, so athlete response, uh, you, they can use this off-field time uh, in the recovery days to identify and rectify also aspects of both physical and mental weaknesses during uh, MCO that they develop uh, in preparation for next training session. Athletes should be working towards uh, normalizing uh, pre-MCO routine. Effort has to be put in from the uh, athletes themselves because they're going to have a lot more time um, off-field. Yeah? So in the quotes, rest and recovery is an uh, important aspect of an exercise program because it allows the body time to repair and strengthen itself in between workouts. We know that. It also allows athletes to recover both physically and also psychologically, especially following a long period of retraining. Important to have that mental rest as well to avoid burnout. Okay, hydration break. Um, so the coach's response, hydration break should be increased from the normal frequency, aim to have a quick break every 15 to 20 minutes of training, electrolyte, Drinks are also beneficial alongside consumption of normal water. So if the coach or even the athletes themselves can bring uh, kind of uh, energy drink, um, it will be a more benefit for the athlete. Uh, any drinks consumption should be done with individual disposable bottles. So this avoid cross contamination, especially in the COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, ORS um, oral rehydration salt. This uh, should be consumed to reduce heat stress um, for those that suffer frequent muscle cramps. So the athletes that normally have a frequent muscle cramp, they know themselves um, how uh, how effective uh, consumption of ORS, ORS is. So they will they would need to have uh, access to it uh, to uh, buy it themselves and consume it before training. Uh, use of carbohydrate and protein drink the training session to promote recovery. So some athletes also have um, their own individualized uh, kind of protein drink amounts that they take. Uh, again, not athletes are the same and some may require more than others. So um, so this has to be uh, kind of the athlete's uh, own um, efforts. Uh, if, for example, you are mostly in, 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 in an individual sport, um, some team sport, if they have a nutritionist, um, along with them, uh, normally this is kind of um, already uh, readily available uh, to them. I think also need to be wary of consuming a non-approved energy drink, um, as it may have a significant side effect, especially with doping cases and stuff like that. Uh, MCO means a lot of uh, kind of bad businesses operating because people are affected financially by it. So they they need the help of athletes to endorse so be careful with uh, especially um, uh, non-fda approved um, uh, energy drinks and supplements that athletes uh, do decide to consume okay failing to stay hydrated can hinder your sport performance even losing just one percent of your body water content to sweat and dehydration can make you less effective as an athlete. You may experience headache, 
mental confusion and fatigue. So making fast decision gets harder when you are dehydrated and can put you at risk of developing injuries. Okay. Next one, we are going to move on to listening to uh, an athlete's body. Um, so the coach's response, um, overtraining can cause uh, negative uh, side effects um, such as a physical burnout. Uh, burnout is basically a point of exhaustion. Any efforts after, ex uh, after exhaustion is seen like um, uh, you're driving a car with like a broken radiator. Uh, uh, with time, it will break down the whole engine system, huh? so you need to be careful with that. Uh, avoid unnecessary demand on the body beyond its capabilities. Uh, careful stepwise approach should be exercised at this initial phase. Okay. Also, a mental game uh, needs a needs a break. Uh, careful with uh, repetitive uh, strain injuries (RSI). So rest is best. Some Think that they have a nagging injury, uh, for instance, like uh, shin spin. Um, I had an example like uh, I had a squash player, uh, he had a shin spin not going away. We changed his program, reduced the load, increased the rest and recovery, and he made a good uh, overcome uh, that uh, shin spin injury because shin spin is a repetitive strain injury and it's only going to go away with. Uh, loading and rest okay so you need to be recognizing that type of injury as well um, signs from the with the athlete uh, action you need to know that signs from the body is vitally important to act upon uh, especially at the point of um, breakdown so you need to report of minor injuries to coaches so actions can be taken um, either uh, increase recovery or redesign training, the load and the frequency, like I said. And um, importantly, also be professionally cautious. What I, what I mean by professionally cautious is that if you suspect something that is not within your norm, act on it. Tell the coaches, you know, you can go for a recovery massage. So be professional about it. Uh, even someone... Uh, if you, if you follow the, um, sorry, I'm referring to football again because I watch football a lot. So if you if you see football, even athletes at the top of their um, ladder, they, they report even a minor injury because they know that their body is worth so much that they need to see kind of the bigger picture or the long-term picture rather than something that is kind of acute and that can be uh, recovered kind of in a, in a short period of time. So sometimes they are even willing to miss out on the, on the, on the final of, of, of a big cup competition just because of these uh, niggling injuries. Um, me working with uh, some football team, I know that um, some will just brush kind of the injuries under the carpet, uh, kind of just you know use painkillers and just go again. However, this um, is not the right approach uh, to use because you're going to have a long-term injury especially when working with a young athlete um, below 21 and stuff like that as well, okay? So in the quotes, uh, athletes likely experience uh, aches and pain over the course of the season. Uh, some are worse than others. However, athletes may not always appreciate the severity of the pain they are feeling, which can lead to season or career-ending injuries. So you always need to appreciate the severity of the pain, huh? Okay, so next one is, and the last one, uh, this is the last strategy, is engaging uh, sport science. So the coach's response, um, obviously sport science uh, should be fully utilized. So again, with a gradual buildup, you need to create an effective uh, periodization plan early uh, based on the advice and input from especially um, the strength and conditioning team. Uh, they should be the first point of communication to construct a graded approach to physical training. Um, if some uh, team, uh, especially more elite ones, uh, they have uh, uh, they can gather training data from GPS tracking. Um, use this from a sports uh, physiologist uh, 
uh, team. So, sports science should be uh, fully utilized and the coach need to uh, recognize this, okay? Um, close communication um, with uh, the sports science expert is key uh, to reducing the number of days off, uh, thus achieving the optimum success uh, for the athletes. Uh, of course, referral to the sports medical team um, if uh, the athletes have any illnesses and injuries should be made a priority. Like I said, um, you should also consider a medical recheckup if last done uh, more than one year ago. Okay, athlete response, uh, sports nutritionist. Uh, you can seek the sports nutritionist help uh, to find an optimal uh, body composition or forming a nutritional uh, plan. Uh, also, a sports psychologist, especially the ones that are affected negatively with MCO, um, so they can help with correcting the mental approach to retraining. Athletes play a close role with sports scientists. Uh, they are more accepting, the athletes are more accepting when they see facts and figures. So, proactiveness in seeking help is a strength and a difference between being a good and a bad athlete. Okay. So prevention of sports injury is a priority for sports stakeholders across the spectrum of training and competition. Uh, achieving this objective uh, requires a multidisciplinary approach, or MDT, with sports scientists, particularly the SNC experts, playing an important role in the process. So when considering sports injury prevention strategies, the role of the sports scientist can extend beyond uh, observing exercise techniques and prescribing training to develop a robust and resilient athlete. So multidisciplinary approach for a more collective effort and input to achieve a greater performance. So it's not just the coach, it's not just the athlete, it's not just the sports um, uh, scientist experts, it's a collective uh, team uh, effort, collective effort to, to achieve uh, a greater performance. Huh? Okay, so how can coaches implement these strategies? So first, we need to recognize that no athlete is the same. So as much as possible, try to create an individualized training. Um, some athletes may have more uh, more work done, more intensity done during MCO, and some are doing kind of less. Uh, so you need really to find a balance between uh, underload uh, versus overload. So if an athlete already doing much during uh, MCO and you you doing the same as you would with other athletes that are underloading, you're not going to create the balance. I try to create an individualized training for each athlete. Uh, realize that injuries can be lowered through proactive action, like I said, so injuries are not all up. Uh, be approachable, uh, so you need to get to know your players, uh, try to understand uh, their motivation, uh, goals, and habits. This will help to, this will help to uh, get the athlete to buy in to your trust. Yeah? I would say, like, uh, take for example, uh, the man in the picture there is a uh, Jürgen Klopp. Uh, if you've been for, I know if most, if, if some of you have been following, um, how he uh, embraces his players, uh, they, the players themselves find to that trust and respect him as a coach. And you can implement more strategies with the athletes if uh, they kind of uh, agree to um, or kind of uh, respect your decisions. Eh? So be, be on safe and cautious side, especially in the initial phase, uh, using all resources available, like we discussed, the sports scientists. Um, also, open communication, embrace and accepting. So you need to take advice. Open and discuss effectively. I say, like, not SNC experts um, uh, good as well, and not coaches are good as well. So you need to work out what's good, especially uh, with working on a common goal. So you need to openly discuss uh, effectively and try to kind of share some input and ideas uh, so that you can move forward uh, from there. So be respectful in this situation. Uh, 
uh, always work in a harmonious uh, environment. Uh. Uh, being open to uh, implement change, of course, as well. Day-to-day, um, -day, you can use the wellness questionnaire, which is a very good uh, uh, template uh, for you to kind of gather um, uh, input and how the athletes are feeling. There, there is a question uh, surrounding how they can put it in numerical values, their mental well-being and health and, and how they are feeling physically, how their body is feeling and how much sleep are they are getting. So it's a very uh, kind of easy template to use for the athletes, for the coaches to get a better understanding of the athletes' well-being. Uh, they can use RPE as well, uh, post-training, rating of perceived exertion. Uh, so when you use these, you can actually be kind of know that you as an athlete are taking care of the or you are yeah you are taking care of the athlete and you 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 understand what they are going through and how much efforts and stuff like that so you can act on it huh, as a coach so also collecting data uh using the you know, stuff like rpe on the questionnaire uh it can help in improving your training design okay i will share you uh just quickly um, how uh, AIS, which is the Australian Institute of Sports, they have developed a graded uh, return, uh, which is graded from level A, B, and C. Okay, there is no time frame uh, available here. Um, however, um, uh, it will be with uh, kind of the federal guidelines they will put a time frame inside. Huh? Um, as you can see, I just I just point out uh, basketball there. Um, so in the level A, uh, it's all just no ball handling drills, um, so very low impact. Uh, and then level B, uh, again, non-contact still. However, they're allowed to do kind of uh, passing, shooting, defending drills, for small groups, no more than 10. And then level C, which is a full training and competition okay and then i will share quickly also aspata guideline they have created a graded uh, return to play uh, again so again do note there are no time frame because of the continuing easing and restriction in place uh, respectively from each country um, so there is a, a guideline for contact and non-contact spot as well uh, so you can see on the arrow there phase one phase two phase three and phase four um so this is a graded return so that the athletes uh, can use this as a guideline to um have a, a better approach to retraining and avoid injuries obviously as well as alongside uh, having uh, ensuring that um we are minimizing the risk of uh, contacting covid 19 okay and the last table i would like to share is also um uh, overview of exercise intensity um as well as exercise and recovery duration um for training with uh, elite football okay as you can see uh aerobic to uh, aerobic low intensity training aerobic moderate intensity training um, you can see there's a numerical uh, value for each one. So this is uh, important uh, to guide the gradual progression of returning to train. So this is kind of the, the kind of the prioritization that um, obviously uh, the coaches and the strength and conditioning team um, can uh, devise a similar kind of um, planning for the athletes. Okay, so just to finish off in conclusion, so like I said, rate of injury is a control by uh, variable. The more we do, the lower the number of injuries will be. Observe the stepwise approach. Try to apply uh, above strategies as much as possible. Um, obviously, within uh, the logistical kind of um, hindrance, uh, so try and uh, apply some possible uh, no pain no gain again should not be applied at early stage exercise proportion with gradual approach 
Uh, always be on the safe side. Uh, play a role to tone down athlete enthusiasm. Also, professionalism is a way to go. Teamwork and communication, like you said, is a collective effort for the common goal. So the common goal is, of course, uh, achieving the best possible uh, success for the athlete. So uh, I hope that um, when the coaches out there, uh, you know, uh, take on board the injury prevention uh, programs that are available, um, they can implement this. Um, don't just throw it out the window. Um, implement this and gather the data, and you can see how much injuries and how much um, you can lower down the number of, of injuries uh, to the athlete. So take a proactive approach. Try to be, uh, if not already, uh, most of you are professional, but if you're not already, be more professional about your work and you can have a professional approach and obviously uh, get a better success for the athlete. Thank you very much for tuning in. So we move on to Q and A session. So, if anyone has a has a question, you can ask them now. Okay, if uh, just waiting if there are any questions from you guys regarding the webinar just now. Okay, so if there's uh, no questions, uh, I will end this uh, webinar. Uh, I would like to say thank you again um, for all that are tuning in and hopefully uh, uh, this webinar will be of benefit to all of you um, and hopefully we can uh, have greater success for um, the sports industry uh, both nationally and internationally. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you very much.
Thank you. 